When we talk to policymakers about the importance of the work that, that our landowners do, our partners do, and the ranchers out on the land, and we talk about the ecosystem services that are delivered by these working lands, and we say it's really valuable work, and they say, well, how valuable? And so we've, for years, we struggled to try to find a way to put that into perspective to where folks can understand just how important that work is and how valuable it is. So several years ago, we commissioned a study with Dr. Lynn Hunsinger and her team at UC Berkeley to monetize the values of ecosystem services. So it's my pleasure now to kick off this summit with our first speaker, Dr. Lynn Hunsinger from UC Berkeley, who's going to discuss more about the, the monetization of ecosystem services. Thanks, Mike, no pressure. Um, I want to say one of the things that's always been a huge problem for me at uh, CRCC meetings is who to eat lunch with. I just feel like I want to be around everybody and I like everybody and I want to talk to them all. So if I flip from table to table, then I feel shallow. And if I only stay at one table, then I feel that I've missed all kinds of people that I wanted to talk to because we don't see each other. We're spread out, as we just talked about, on the wide open range, and we don't get enough time to socialize. But we'll make do here. And I'm so glad to see all the faces on the screen and names. <laughs> okay, so I'll give this a shot today. Um, okay, I have to open my slides. Sorry. This is typical, isn't it? All right, one second. And I can't talk while I do this. <laughs> it's impossible in terms of setting up technological things. So uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm gonna talk about our project that the California Rangeland uh, Trust on values and return on investment of conservation easements held by the California Rangeland Trust. Now, Van Butzik's is the economics brain on this project and I'm the range manager, but I have learned so much. So I'll try to convey to you what we learned and our results today. If I can make it turn. Okay, so first of all, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about the distribution of rangelands. For most of you, that will be uh, very familiar information, but um, maybe not for everybody. So. Um, these are rangelands of California. California has a total acreage. Actually, I started out here. California has a total acreage of 100 million acres. And as you can see, rangelands are shrubs, herbaceous areas, deserts, and I count woodlands of all kinds because pinyon, juniper, and oak woodlands are, of course, major rangeland resources in California. More than half of the state is actually rangeland. That doesn't mean it's all grazed, but because uh, the definition of rangeland for us is based on vegetation types, but it's 57 million acres. That's a lot of the state and it's 61% publicly owned. Let's break that down. There's our primary rangelands, according to FRAP. And uh, let's look at the ownership. So we have uh, 22 million acres of private land in the state. That's the yellow. 35 million acres of public land, like Forest Service and BLM, National Park Service, Department of Defense, plus lots of little uh, municipal preserves and regional parks, some of them not so little, and state parks. Uh, we actually have quite a bit of public land scattered throughout our major private areas, which are uh, of course, Mediterranean grasslands or annual grasslands and oak woodlands, depending on how you want to define that, coastal prairie, et cetera. So land trusts also have conserved a lot of land in California, about 5.8 million acres. It includes easements by uh, non-governmental organizations like the California Range Land Trust and uh, fish and wildlife easements and for conservation easements, there are a lot of easements out there. It's very hard for me anyway to get a handle on the exact number or acreage. Land trusts also acquire land, sometimes reconveying it or keeping it as preserves. So that's all included in there. Purple dots are a map I found of conservation easements in California. And of course it's not exact. I don't know how what's included and what's not of all kinds of conservation easements, but it illustrates how scattered these are in our Mediterranean ecosystems, meaning the ones that are dry in the summer and wet. 
And um, they're important. They're very important for biodiversity uh, in the global scale. We have a lot of species, a lot of native species and so on. Uh, in fact, 51% of the listed species in the United States uh, live on, their primary habitat is on land. And 59% of listed species that are on grazing land or grazed rangeland are positively influenced by grazing in California, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. I didn't make this up. This is their data, which Sheila brilliantly organized. For example, and here we're really stealing from Sheila's work, uh, not yet published, can't wait. Uh, but if you just look at the San Francisco Bay Area, more than a fourth of it is public or under easement. 43% that is grazed, both public and under easement. And 63% of the land that the Conservation Land Network has said is essential or important to conservation is great. So clearly there's a, a mutual relationship between biodiversity and grazing. Are so many public entities in the Bay Area would not be engaged in it and supporting it because of its contributions to biodiversity, fire hazard reduction, and so on. So the study that the California Rangeland Trust sponsored is about doing um, ecosystem service monetary values for the rangelands that they have uh, in trust, that are in trust, they and ranchers have in trust. So, um, Wonderful project, by the way. So enjoyed working with everybody. Uh, now, why do we do ecosystem service valuation? You know, in a survey I did of ranchers asking them to tell me how much they would take for selling their ranch, about half said there is no price. It's not for sale and never will be. Uh, ecosystem service values uh, don't fully reflect the values that we all have for rangelands. There is not anything that can do that, I'm afraid. But knowing at least some demonstrable, viable uh, 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 evidence-based, rigorous analysis, knowing at least the ways we can get from the biodiversity or the biophysical, the aspects of the property and the ecosystem services that the property produces, you know, that, that gives us a decision-making tool so that when we in a public venue says, well, we wanna put in a, a shopping center here or a freeway, um, we can say, well, you're going to, you know, erase this many um, much value in ecosystem services. Is it worth it really? Is this the best place to put it? And the other use, which um, the California Rangeland Trust is particularly interested in, is where do they get the best bang for the buck? Where are the ecosystem services values optimized by an easement? Among other things, there's other things that go into the decision. But um, we identified economic values of ecosystem services, and also we added to this that not very many, in fact, none that I know of studies of this kind of done. We looked at the return on investment on the CRT's easements. Uh, I'll explain this later, but we did it in an unusual way and a way that we think is important. And then ecosystem services, uh, I'll define them as the goods and services provided in nature that fit people like food and water. Um, I happen to feel that their um, work landscapes ecosystem services are produced by a combination of stewardship and nature, but for this study we're looking at nature. Okay, so we took two approaches, traditional benefits transfer, which I happen to think is the most accurate because it's based on the papers that we could find in the literature that are most applicable to California. So we looked at all of them. So it's more local and more relevant, I think, than the method, but the other method is based on an international database that many people all over the world use. So we decided to put it in that framework too. And the traditional benefits transfer also includes the element of how many people will see this easement and benefit from it. Because remember, ecosystem services are things from nature that benefit people. We don't want to forget that. And so the more people that benefit from it under the traditional benefits transfer system, uh, the more it's worth. So we picked somebody who lived within 50 miles of the easement. And I know that's not 
strictly true because people from farther away may go and see it and people closer up may not, you know, but it's intimate. so much of this work is and then the global average that uses an international database of like the value of woodlands around the world that has been compiled by ecosystems valuation people uh, all over the world. So it's a little less specific, but more um, international uh, and legible to people all around the world. So it uses global averages to value individual ecosystem services. And we use GI now S analysis to attach those ecosystem values to what is located on uh, conservation rangeland trust easements, looking at how much ecosystem services or the value of the ecosystem services produced per year for grassland, woodland, and forest. So we found that for using the traditional benefits transfer, uh, purchased easements had a value of $1.17 billion per year, every year. You know, I would take that as an investment, frankly. And if you added in the donated easements, which we excluded, we had to exclude in our uh, return on investment scenario because there's no price for the California interest on donated easements. But in terms of the ecosystem services produced, uh, 1.44 billion per year, it, it, ups, it ups the amount of ecosystem services produced, of course. And the same with the global average, 274 million per year. Yes, that's less than 1.17, but that's really a lot. And if you add in the donated easements, it's even more. And these are the results, the full results that we came up with. So it's a very long table. There's a lot of stuff in it, but uh, it basically um, expresses, here are the numbers that I just read to you. Under traditional benefits transfer, 1.17, global average 2.74 for all the purchased easements, and then for all purchased and donated easements, 1.14 and 364 million. Now, the next numbers relate to return on investment, which I'll explain how we did that in a minute, or maybe I'll explain it now. Let's see. The one thing that uh, appraisals do before you do a conservation easement is the assessor decides what's the highest and best use of the land, what he sees, and this is one person's opinion of the outlook, but a professional who's good at this, uh, as the highest and best use of the land. And that may have to do with water availability, um, what's going on in the county with real estate, et, uh, et cetera. Um, and it will be like developed to one acre lots or developed to a hundred acre lots. In most cases, it's pretty large lot size. And if you use that, then the return on investment is not so good. 92 cents per dollar investment. This is one of three high, uh, scenarios we modeled um, and so on. You, you do uh, with all purchased and donated, you are getting a return. But nonetheless, not so great under that scenario. If you look at the maximum development level under current zoning, then uh, that's what we think is probably the most realistic. In addition to which technology and water and everything like that availability is likely to change ugh, one way or the other due to technology or uh, drought. So if you consider the maximum development allowed under the current zoning, then your return in, on investment looks pretty good. And we think that's pretty realistic. And that's a pretty good return on your investment. I would also make that investment. Now, what most of these assessments do is a development scenario. You assume that the minute that the, not the minute, but you assume that once the easement isn't protected, all of its ecosystem services will be lost all of them. And so there you get quite a high return. And every other uh, study like this that you've read uses this scenario. And I'll tell you why we use the other two, but um, you can see that that's how you get these enormous numbers. And that's how you get uh, the highest return on investment is if you say, okay, if we don't put this easement on this, we're going to lose everything. 
So the key findings we made is that the value of ecosystem services on CRT lands is high, about 364 million to 1.44 billion annually, depending on an estimation methods. And if you're using total benefits transfer or the other. And rangelands return $1.35 to $3.47 for ever, every dollar invested under the assumption that they would develop to the current zoning maximum. And if you assume that all the ecosystem services would be lost without a conservation easement in place, returns rise to $42.20 to $167.76 per dollar investment. So we think that conserving rangelands is a good investment and is vital to protect <laughs> and the benefits that they provide to society. Now, the reason we did our scenarios the way we did, oh, I lost a slide, but the reason we did our scenarios the way we did, it has, um, it may, you know, it may not be, um, if you buy an easement on a piece of property that is never going to be developed, or you pay for an easement on a piece of property that's never going to be developed, under a return on investment scenario, realistically, your investment hasn't made any difference. Your investment makes a difference and preserves ecosystem services when there's some danger that the land will be developed or planted. So, um, that's why we did these three scenarios so that you can look based on a return on investment at a more realistic look at what you've conserved. And by doing that, we were able to provide a framework for the trust on how they might select easements in the future or prioritize them. And I do wanna make it clear that this doesn't count everything. It doesn't count relations with the with voluntary nature of the easement. It doesn't count there's endangered species on the property or some super important uh, environmental characteristic that helps make it as more important to conservation. It doesn't count all of those things. But you can use this formula to figure out how you could, on the basis of ecosystem services, which is just one basis, maximize your return on investment. One is to pick parcels that are relatively close to population. And you can see why under the traditional benefits transfer system that would be valuable. Um, you want them to be close to the population so that uh, more people can use it and see it. And then the value is higher under that calculation. But you also want them to be parcels that are most at risk. That also ups your return on investment. So those would be two reasons to prioritize an easement or to select an easement. And another would be a loss per acre. And that tends to be large, larger properties. That doesn't mean that other things can't supersede, but these are the three things we can arrive at from looking at return investment. We know there's really high uncertainty and that our counterfactuals, as we call them, our scenarios developed, not developed, super developed, uh, are changing and will continue to change, but this gives us a point in time approximation. And the current investments from the Rangeland Trust yield a positive return on investment, that's for sure. And other factors, as I said before, count to overwhelm these. So that's the results of our study. But we discovered in the course of doing our study that we couldn't include all the values. Remember, I can't, we can't re re include uh, some of the values really that people have of, of never wanting to sell their land, of considering it priceless, uh, which I agree with, but that's hard to monetize. Uh, but there are also some values that we couldn't include that we think are important to monetize. One of them is the benefits of the grazing process itself. For example, grazing has been shown to remove 116 million pounds of fuel per uh, in California at a very conservative estimate because the data was only not available for all areas in 2017. That's a lot of pounds of flammable grass and shrublands, a lot of fuel that grazing removes. Um, it reduces fine fuel and it can slow the encroachment of shrubs and trees onto grasslands in certain ecosystems. So grazing has a definite value, the process for um, definite monetary value there. I think you can see that compared to the billions we're spending rebuilding our communities. 
Um, and the pounds of fuel removed per acre per cattle is part of the study, and it's pretty darn significant. Varies with the size of the region, uh, but also with the productivity of the region and the number of cows. We need more. Uh, grazing also is important for biodiversity. I started out talking about that a little bit, but if you look at these two pictures by Stuart Weiss of Tulare Hill, um, this is what it looked like when it was grazed, and then the decision was made to take grazing off in the interest of conservation. And here's what it looked like after. We know, those of us who spend time on the range, that the annual grasses that dominate most of our rangelands can really suppress uh, native species and influence uh, native habitat in a way that the animals are not adapted to. And grazing is a way to remove that extra biomass every year. These are some of the species that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has identified as benefiting from grazing. And there's a lot of them. I think they're familiar to many of us. But spotted owls, for example, I mean spotted owls, excuse me. Uh, burrowing owls really like to see what's coming up on them and they peek out of their burrows and if it's a thick carpet of annual grass, they can't see anything and they like the seeds too and San Joaquin Fox likes to see as well. There's all kinds of reasons. Grazing uh, makes vernal pools last, last longer so these little fairy shrimp and various amphib amphibians like tiger salamanders have time to develop um, and also helps uh, remove the annual grasses that would shade out these little endemic species. Of course, they're little. They're not adapted to our annual grasses. They're new. So um, Sheila, again, did this work looking at how 64% of listed animal and 56% of listed plant species on rangeland are reported in their listing documents to benefit from grazing. There's also some grazing factors that can negatively impact some of them, but with proper stewardship, they're very beneficial. And land sharing, as they call it in the conservation biology literature, or doing agriculture and ecosystem conservation at the same time, is an ideal scenario for working lands. They can, we, we are, our goal should be to keep agricultural lands profitable, and a poor risk of conversion or intensification to conserve species and reduce fire hazard and et cetera. So many other things, also livelihoods. So that slide went through quickly. I must have pushed too hard. Anyway, uh, targeted grazing, another value that we can use to look at the value of the grazing process. So we're working on this project. We have uh, the support of the California Rangeland Trust and the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition, which I'm very grateful to, and Russell Rustici also. And so we're looking forward to working on this in the next two years for consultation and collaborators as well. So we'll be able to work with some of you. A little different from the uh, ecosystem service valuation because we won't have sec much secondary data to work with. We have to create the data ourselves. So it's going to be a challenge. So thank you. California Rangeland Trust has uh, ideas for how you can support rangeland conservation in California. And I'll let you uh, look those over yourself. Do we have times for questions, Teresa? We do. And we have one right out the bat prayer for you, Lynn. Okay. Uh, in recent, I'm going to read this so I, can, I don't mess it up. In recent state conservation strategies, such as the climate or the 30 by 30 initiative, rangelands are not recognized. Instead, rangelands is associated with vegetation cover types, grassland, forest, shrub. Does this matter? Yes, I think it matters. I wrote a public comment and I encourage people by February 15th, you can write comments on 3030 and I'm looking forward to learning more about it today because I've only given it a rather cursory look, but I'm really curious about how that's gonna work. Uh, on the climate strategy, canceling rangelands, <laughs> it matters, it matters a lot in policy and in what people uh, think about and in the kind of skill sets that they bring to the table because that, reports suffered, I think. Um, I don't think enough expertise about rangelands was there and involved. 
And if rangelands don't exist, then that expertise won't be there either. Rangelands are not forests, you know, and they're not strictly speaking grasslands. Uh, they are a very dynamic mixed vegetation area. I think they're more realistic than those classifications because range grasslands turn into brushlands, turn into forests, turn into grassland. You know, it's a dynamic landscape. And so we really need uh, rangeland people involved in those efforts. And I'm talking about people who've been trained scientifically as well as experienced ranchers and people who know the country um, and have been, you know, know the country. We need that. Another question. Are you aware of any studies that evaluate the ecosystem services value on irrigated pasture? I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm sorry, but um, I wish that if Van could have been here, he could have addressed that, but um, maybe, <laughs> but I don't know of any. And I've looked at a lot of ecosystem service lecture material, so I don't, you know, um, there you go. You touched on one of the areas, fire fuel management or, or control that you weren't able to cover in this existing study. And you kind of touched on the new study. Are there any other areas that after having gone through this, done, done the study, besides the fire fuels that you really wanted to dive in deeper or wish there was more information out there? Well, uh, for the value of grazing, it's both fire and fuels, value to listed species, you know, um, and, um, and value for targeted grazing. So all of those things I want to incorporate into this study and through consultation, maybe we'll find some others. That was the one that struck me as the most tragically missing that it was feasible to do. We'll find out if it's feasible, but we're assuming it is. Um, there are, I, I don't right offhand have a second, uh, a nominee for second place <laughs> in terms of what I'd like to study that's worth thinking about. And I'm sure the study, I'll find out more. I mean, rangelands have so much value. We looked at, well, there's just, there's all kinds of things in this study of ecosystem service values that we couldn't include. I wish we had more specific information for California ecosystems than we have. So anybody who did any on the ground study of say Oak Woodlands and their ecosystem service value would be making a big contribution. So I wish very much that we'd had more local California derived information to use in this study. I think, uh, of the traditional benefits transfer, it's less than 10, maybe nine studies that applied. I'd rather it be 20 and more of them in California because we know our ecosystem is so different from the rest of the United States, a lot of it is. Um, and I don't mean to discount the east side. That's also a special ecosystem. Um, but um, we know that our ecosystems are special and valuable and so more local studies would be very valuable. Another question, one slide showed cultural benefits. Was there any input you used or saw that related to the mental health costs and things like the new nature deficit disorder diagnosis? Yeah, no, not directly. That would be great. Um, in these studies that went into the transfer benefit study and the global database, they do assess, especially in the global database, people's willingness to pay or is or stated choice, either one, they use both, but it's what people say they would pay to visit a site becomes the most common uh, way to assess ecosystem services. And you would think that might include some of that element because people, but the nature deficit thing is particularly sad because I think a lot of people don't even realize what they're missing, which makes it difficult to measure. But um, if somebody knew the cost of that, there might be a way to factor that in, yes. It's wonderful to be in California um, and see the amount of open space we still have. But I've been to parts of the county country where if you're in the city, you're in the city for miles and miles and miles and miles. Um, the foresight in setting up the East Bay Regional Parks and in the conservation easements that have been established in various parts are a huge 
contribution, I think, to people's well-being. I know I used to work in Sacramento and I just loved driving back through the hills and seeing the open space there. Even though I know it's not open space, it's home. <laughs> much, much more to it than that. Yes. Uh, another question, what were the biggest types of ecosystem services driving the easement's dollar value? Do they line up with the PES markets, policies in existence today? Well, the biggest payment for ecosystem services market, I think, is actually conservation easements. It's a willing uh, seller or willing donor, willing buyer type of situation. And the price of a conservation easement incorporates so many things or how much we pay for them incorporates so many aspects of that. I don't quite know how to compare that. And I actually think it's the best way to value ecosystem services on rangeland is as a bundle or the best way to look at them is as a bundle. Because rangeland California so many different values to say we're going to do payment for ecosystem services for carbon or we're going to do payment for ecosystem services for a listed species. Really bundling that makes so much more sense for the landowner uh, and for the assessment of rangelands values, because if we touch one value, we're going to influence another. And those need to be considered those trade offs and I'm afraid that if we just do PES for one thing. We're missing those trade-offs and we're encouraging people to do things in value that may not be great for another. So I I, uh, I, think the model of bundling services is best. That's about all I have to say with that. I don't know. For endangered species, I certainly think that the, um, the values that we found do track because they provide habitat. And as I showed in the slides, most of our habitat is on uh, private land and the Bay Area private graze land. And so um, that lines up. Um, I, I personally feel the carbon sequestration thing lines up. Um, and I can't think of where they would not to some extent, but not perfectly, of course. Great, right, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Hunsinger? She has offered up to share her presentation, so you will be getting a link to that. So thank you for that great presentation. Now you, hopefully everybody can understand how excited we are at the Rangeland Trust to have benefited from the information here. And when we now when we go to policymakers, we have a very clear way of demonstrating just how valuable these ecosystem services are to everybody in the state. So thank you, Dr. Hunsinger and your team for a wonderful report study and we look forward to the next one. You know, I have one uh, one other thing. If anybody is interested in uh, advising us on this um, next project on the value of grazing or has some questions, further questions or information you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to e email me. Um, I'm on Google, but it's huntsinger at berkeley.edu. So thank you. Great. Thank you.